Welcome to the third and final lecture on the regulation and future role of electricity DSOs. In our example of the small solar town, which is able to generate more electricity than the people living there can consume during sunny days and which also has some energy storage and demand response potential, we saw that the distribution system operators cannot continue their business as usual way of operating grids anymore. When moving from passive distribution networks to active system management, these DSOs become real system operators. The local energy resources can actually offer a whole range of products that help to manage uh, short-term problems in the grid. So for instance, they can be used for balancing purposes or for voltage and frequency control. And they also can be used to reduce losses or to postpone or even avoid investments into new lines. Some of these products are clearly relevant for either the transmission or the distribution system operator, but there are other resources which might be interesting for both types of grid operators. So for instance, a demand response potential could be used to solve local congestion problems, or it also could be used to offer balancing services to the transmission system operator. So regulation has to guide this TSO-DSO interactions and the coordination and information exchange will become particularly important and the products that these different grid operators use to ensure reliability of uh, the system need to be clearly defined in terms of geography and timing. What can we now say about the boundary of the DSO vis-a-vis -vis the markets? Well, there are a number of areas where there is no consensus yet whether the respective tasks should be under the responsibility of the DSO or not. When it comes to data handling, for instance, one might argue that the regulated entity should uh, be responsible for that in order to ensure a non-discriminatory and neutral data provision. But should it then also be the DSO? Similar questions we could ask uh, with respect to uh, the management and operation of metering equipment or also with respect to electric vehicle charging infrastructure. In theory, these tasks could be fulfilled by a regulated agent, which could be the DSO or also a third regulated party, or they could be opened up for competition. And the major advantage of these liberalized models uh, is that um, the technology choice is left to the market and competitive pressure will um, increase efficiency and will also incentivize the agents to innovate. But a regulated model can benefit from scale and scope economies on the contrary and also the mass rollout of a new technology might be easier because the costs can be socialized among all grid users. So the suitability of a certain model will depend on the particular characteristics of the system and it will also depend on the level of unbundling. And so an insufficiently unbundled DSO should then either stay with a restricted set of tasks or it could expand its portfolio of activities but accompanied with stricter rules regarding unbundling. But again, many open questions remain. So for instance, how to treat these small uh, DSOs which are exempted from unbundling requirements and do they also have the capabilities to invest into ICT infrastructures and to become real system operators? How on, or how to guarantee the uh, availability of relevant data to all interested parties, which are not only retailers but also aggregators or energy service companies? Let me conclude this short series of video lectures. This newly emerging broad range of local energy resources, including not only distributed generation, but also local energy storage, electric vehicles, or even active demand, does not only pose various challenges on DSOs and system operation, but it also offers plenty of opportunities for new business models related to the aggregation and marketing of these resources. And also DSOs themselves can benefit from using these local resources for their system operation. So the regulation of DSOs has to re be reviewed in its full spectrum, considering the DSO as a network operator, being a regulated entity, 
but also considering the DSO as a market facilitator along the supply chain. So considering the DSO as a network operator, we have to look at the regulation related to the allowed remuneration and related to tariff design. So first, the allowed remuneration of electricity DSOs has to take account of the increasing cost structures and it also has to allow the DSOs to become real system operators. And second, the grid tariffs should reflect the true costs of the different types of grid users that may connect to the system and they should send efficient economic signals. Considering the DSO as a key player along the supply chain means that we have to look at the boundary of the DSO vis-a-vis -vis the transmission system operator as well as vis-a-vis -vis the energy and power markets. And so here one first can conclude that the general responsibilities of grid operators of course do not change, but the tools available to perform their tasks are enriched by these local energy resources. And regulation has to guide this TSO-DSO interaction. And finally, if a new task should be under the responsibility of a DSO or not, will depend on the specific conditions in the system and it will also depend on the level of unbundling. I now invite you to read more about the regulation and future role of electricity DSOs in our THINK report and also to immediately go to the online discussion forum to select one of these open questions we raised during the lectures and to tell us your opinion about it.